Good afternoon, Brussels. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this online seminar hosted by the Florence School of Banking and Finance, live from Villa Raimondi. I am Pierre Schlosser, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our seminar of today with the European Commission on the future of the banking union. I am excited by the fact that you are almost 200 with us. It's great to see so many participants coming from Europe and beyond to review with us the banking union's progress and perhaps more importantly chart out a concrete direction for its completion. As many of you will be aware of, less than a month ago the Commission published a communication entitled Completing the Banking Union where it sets out in a nutshell new ideas on the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, presents measures to address non-performing loans, sketches a common fiscal backstop and introduces a new type of security called sovereign bond backed securities, SBBS pour les intimes. Against this background, the purpose of today's seminar will be to look at those issues in sequence and reflect on the banking union's future prospects. Let me very warmly welcome our speakers of today and introduce you first to Mario Nava, who is Director for Financial System Surveillance and Crisis Management at the European Commission's DG FISMA. Besides his numerous functions, Mario has been an active alternate member of the FBF's Advisory Council since its creation and I'm therefore particularly grateful that he is with us today. Welcome Mario and thank you again. Mario will introduce his colleagues Julia, Marcos and Davide, who I welcome too. On a lighter note, and since we are less than eight hours away from a crucial football game, I can't resist to point out that they form today a joint and harmonious Italian and Swedish team. Another person I'd like to thank is Emiliano Tornese from TG FISMA who has been instrumental in preparing this online seminar. Thanks a lot Emiliano. This is a tense online seminar we're organizing since the school's creation and there will be more to come. Now before giving the floor to Mario I'd like to spend three minutes to introduce you to our school's upcoming activities and to say a few words about you participating in today's seminar. Part of the Robert Schumann Center, the Florence School of Banking and Finance was established in January 2016 at the European University Institute, which is a postgraduate public and international research and executive education institute, whose own establishment dates back to 1972. As a policy debate and executive education platform, the FBF strives to be a place of dialogue, learning and exchange, a place where the new and the older generation meet to learn and discuss recent cutting-edge topics of economic methods, financial stability, risk management, as well as critical issues of banking regulation, supervision and resolution. Since the school was established, we have trained more than 1,000 experts from more than 40 countries. They came from a diversity of institutions. Moving ahead, if you're looking for training opportunities, note that our 2018 courses are just out. So let me briefly guide through four of the, of the next courses we have next year. On 12 and 13 February 2018, Gianni De Nicolo from the IMF and from the school will direct a course on financial stability and regulation, basic concepts and applications. On 26, 27 and 28 February, Christos Gortzos and Serena Grunewald will offer a course on the essentials of EU banking resolution. On 19, 2021 of March, we will have the pleasure to host again Nobu Kyotaki for an advanced course, a very advanced course on financial frictions and macroprudential policies. And then on the 5th and 6th of April 2018, we will host a course on SHREP with Pierre Slavka Oleg uh, from EBA. There are, however, many more courses available, so please check our website or LinkedIn page regularly. And if you're interested in attending our courses, of course, do not wait too long. To, to register. Two more things to flag to you. First, our 2017 ebook on the changing geography of banking and finance is now out. You can download it for free on our website. And second, mark your diary for the 26 April 2018 because on this day we'll host our annual conference which will focus on institutions and the crisis and we hope to see many of you on that day in Florence. Note that the conference can be attended for free. Let me now move back, however, to you. You, the audience, you energized in front of your screen and your iPad and so eager to learn more about the completion of the banking union. We have 48 nationalities represented today. Most of you are from Europe, but we're very glad also to welcome today experts from Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and Ghana, among others. We're very happy to count on several participants, as is now a tradition, from the SRB, the ECB, 
the Commission, the Bank of Italy. Uh, but these are only a few examples as I think that our word cloud illustrates even better the diversity of today's group. What else can I tell you? 47% of you are women, 53% are men. Moreover, you have around seven years of professional experience on average. Most of you are trained economists, then come uh, the lawyers, then the business trained people and other profiles. And lastly, most of you have a master's degree, which, uh, which means six, and 26% of you have a PhD and 8% a bachelor degree. Again, very grateful that so many of you and in this diversity are with us today. So how do we take it from there? Um, well, Mario will first take the floor to frame the context in which the banking union finds itself in. Julia, Marcus, and Davide will then take over. So let me ask, uh, by the way, Mario to uh, switch on this camera and microphone and share them. This presentation sequence will last for about 40 minutes and will be punctuated by poll questions. And then we will open our traditional Q&A session where speakers will first engage with the poll results. Mario, uh, hi again. Let me remind you to speak very close and straight to the microphone. I'll tune back in to moderate the Q&A. In the meantime, uh, over to Brussels. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pierre. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. Um, you are in, in my office, which is the office where uh, part of the, of the EU policy on uh, financial regulation, financial crisis, and so on and on is done. So we decided to keep it as it is. So you see lots of papers. Uh, you see the European flag, of course, there at the end. And then in a moment, you will see my, my, my colleague. The purpose of today is very much what Pierre said. So the purpose of today is really to look at the future of banking union. And we do that uh, on the basis of the uh, banking union communication that the commission published on the, uh, on the 11th of October. And uh, my role is quite minute today. I will stay with you the whole time, but mostly the role will be for my colleagues that I will introduce in a, in a minute. But my role is relatively minute. I just want to set the, the context and tell you why we felt as, uh, we felt as necessary at some moment to come out with the banking union, uh, the banking union communication. Now, the, we have a few slides to, to help. But the, uh, basically, the point is that we, we found now to be at the, at the end of a period of uh, intense financial regulation. Intense financial regulation, which has paid off in the market, in the sense that uh, uh, all the banking indicators have improved quite, uh, quite systematically. We have improved both in terms of capital, total amount of capital, in terms of liquidity uh, and in terms of uh, and in terms of uh, um, quality of, uh, of assets so with those uh, with those three improvements the questions we asked ourselves was whether there was uh, uh, there was a need to um, come up with uh, a narrative uh, which would tell us what else there is to be done now the narrative if you have read the banking union as I presume most of you have done, the narrative is essentially the one of uh, saying, uh, yes, the systemic improvements, uh, so to speak, have been done. So the, the overall uh, situation, the overall financial situation has improved, but the, it remains a, a, a number of areas where there, are, uh, where there are risk. And there we said it remains a number of areas where there are one could call them idiosyncratic risk, so not any more systemic risk that, uh, that put the whole of system in uh, danger, but they are idiosyncratic risk with pockets of risk, and that's what we need to do. We know very well, I mean, 11, 12 of you have either a PhD or a master, so we all know very well that uh, uh, non-treated idiosyncratic risk can get back and become systemic risk. So what we wanted to do with the communication was to pinpoint to those areas, and you will recognize uh, a good uh, balance between risk reduction measures and risk sharing measures, those areas of action where, uh, by dealing with them, we can really improve uh, the overall, uh, the overall uh, 
situation, and in particular, we can achieve uh, one of the purposes that was declared uh, very clearly by, uh, by our president uh, in the State of the Union report, uh, which is uh, the completion of the, of the banking union. So uh, the, the banking union, of course, when we look back at where we were in 2012 uh, with respect to where we are today, the progress is made have been, uh, have been quite massive, but of course we are not yet at completion, that's what we have said very, very clearly, and what the communication tries to explain is which other steps are necessary to get to the, uh, to get to the completion. Now, the uh, content of the, of the communication, as I said, looks at all the uh, future measures uh, that we think are necessary to complete the banking union, but also looks at those measures that have already been put forward uh, in the recent uh, months or, or years. And in particular, as many of you know, in November of last year, we presented a rather, uh, um, a rather let's say, important package of risk reduction measures, uh, which here we nicknamed the, the November package, so that was basically, was basically a year ago. And that November package included a number of measures in the area of loss absorbency capacity, in the area of capital requirements, uh, in the area of some liquidity requirements. It was a package that was proposed in parallel with the advancement uh, of uh, discussions in Basel, of course, and uh, in parallel to what the uh, FSB conclusions uh, for, uh, for the loss absorbency capacity have, uh, have produced. So uh, we have proposed that package to Council and Parliament, uh, and like all things in, uh, in Council and, par and Parliament, that package is progressive. Uh, in some areas uh, we, go, we go faster than in other areas, but I would say that on the, on the package of uh, a year ago, for the time being, uh, we have no particular uh, blockage. I will not risk my reputation here by giving you an exact date by when it will be, uh, it will be adopted, but the, I would say the message I can give you is that we are confident that in due time, once uh, all the discussion has been uh, completed at the legislator level, which is uh, where it must be, in due time, I think this can be, this can be adopted. So this by way of, uh, of introduction and to bring you up to date to everything that has been done till now. Of course, that is the least interesting part. The most interesting part is what comes now, which is uh, what else we are, uh, we are there to do and what else in the banking union communication we said that we would. And in order to do that, uh, I'll introduce you to my colleagues. So now I turn this camera and my colleagues should appear to you, yes, at least they appear to me. So here are my colleagues uh, who they will introduce uh, themselves. Hello everybody, this is Davide Lombardo. Giulia Bertezzolo, I work in the Crisis Management and Resolution Unit uh, where I deal with the Banking Union and uh, the European Deposit Guarantee Scheme. Hello, my name is Marcus Aspegen, and I work within Mario's directorate in a unit dealing with systemic issues on the European Union and the area. Very good. And as, as I said, the, uh, the purpose now is to discuss in detail and in depth, hopefully, the, the three, four areas. So I leave my chair to the first speaker, who is uh, Julia. and. Uh, will introduce you to Edis and Backstop. As I said, I'll stay around and uh, looking forward to your, to your questions. So, um, I will talk to you about um, Edis proposal uh, and the Backstop, which are the two, um, the two missing elements of the architecture of the banking union. Um, maybe the first slide that you're looking at. Mario talked about that. Um, so what is the, the European Deposit Guarantee Scheme is the third pillar of the banking union. Um, as you well know, 
the single supervisory mechanism is the first pillar and is in place and up and running since 2014. The single resolution mechanism is in place since 2014. Um, but what we don't have yet is the Euro European Deposit Guarantee Scheme. For, for the moment, we just have a Deposit Guarantee Scheme at national level. So the idea with the European Deposit Insurance Scheme is to uh, create a, a single uh, Deposit Guarantee Scheme at European level, uh, which would manage, uh, which would, would be managed at European level, and um, uh, to transfer little by little the resources which are now uh, devoted to the deposit insurance scheme at national level at European level. Um, the next slide will tell you what, why we need a European deposit guarantee scheme. Um, of course, to reinforce the, the Eurozone, um, but also to, to, to be more specific, EDIS would have three main um, advantages, which are breaking the link between banks and member states, because in case of bank default, the, the payout would be done at European level and not, not anymore at state level. It would reduce the vulnerability to large local shocks, because of course, if you put together and you sum the funds which are available in each single member state, the uh, resources available are higher, so you can cope with much higher um, default. And uh, this, last but not least, it reinforced deposit of confidence because it would be um, a European scheme which would uh, ensure all depositors in the same way uh, regardless of the geographic, their geographical location. Um, overall, it would, this will uh, strengthen also the banking sector and allow banks to lend more, which is Precondition for um, as you know, uh, following the five president report in 2015, the European Commission put forward the um, And here I would just tell you about the, ma the three main features of the original proposal, which, by the way, I will tell you after is still on the table. And um, the idea there was is to introduce e through three phases, which are insurance phase, um, during which the, the European fund would have only partial uh, resources and uh, would intervene in case of a bank default only uh, after the, the resources at national level are fully depleted. Then uh, we would go to a coinsurance uh, phase in which the European fund would have more resources, progressively more resources, and it would intervene in case of default at the same time as, uh, as the national scheme, but uh, to a limited percentage. Um, and the last phase would be full insurance, in which all the funds uh, available for deposit insurance would be transferred at European level, and only the European scheme would intervene um, in case of a default. Um, important to, to underline that in all three phases, both liquidity shortfalls and losses are covered, but to a limited extent, as we will see like after. Um, and the transition from one phase to another is automatic, meaning that as soon as you reach a certain date, you uh, move from one phase to another. So here, um, here you, you see the three phases, and as you see, the first one, three years, would last three years, the, four, the second four years, and starting from 2000, uh, 2024, we would have full insurance, uh, fully fledged. Um, these, these slides show you um, how the liquidity coverage and the loss coverage would um, would uh, progress over time and uh, depending on the different phases uh, in the proposal which is on the table. Um, and you see the last, uh, last uh, the goal is to have 100% full liquidity.
Um, now, what happened with the banking union communication? As you probably know, um, the proposal has been um, put forward in 2015, and although there has been a lot of progress on a technical level, um, we didn't reach, uh, there was no agreement to adopt the proposal. So the banking union communication goal is to um, put forward some idea to unlock the negotiations. Um, and to put there some ideas for the co-legislators, um, it doesn't imply any withdrawal of the of the current proposal. As I said before, it's still on the table, and as well as the goal of having at the end a fully fledged piece. And um, it's also important to say that um, you might, um, if, you re if you read the banking union communication, you you might have thought that it's not. Uh, uh, very detailed on certain aspects. And this is done on purpose because, uh, of course, the, the communication put forward some idea, but it, they will have to be um, better defined and specified together with the co-legislators during the current negotiation. What are the main suggestions uh, that we put forward in, um, in the communication? We suggest to uh, introduce EDs in a more gradual manner. Uh, Mensurate to the progress made on reduction and tackling legacy, um, which were ma one of the of the main concerns which were raised during the, the negotiations. In fact, many member states and NEP were uh, concerned that banks would have had to be sufficiently sufficiently safe, sufficiently in good shape before. Um, sharing the potential risk of uh, banks default. So the other um, ideas that we put forward are that um, the, the EDs could be introduced through two phases, which are reinsurance and insurance. As I, I described it before, so in insurance, um, EDs would intervene uh, only once that, uh, only after that the national deposit scheme are and coinsurance instead, uh, any coinsurance instead, uh, EDs would intervene at the same time as VGS, but up to a certain percentage, which would progress, progressively increase. Uh, the second main idea is that we uh, would um, have only liquidity coverage up to 100% by 2022 in the first phase, and loss coverage only in the second phase. But the loss coverage would be such the the, the lo loss coverage and the second stage would be subject uh, to co to the fulfillment of certain conditions, and loss coverage would uh, would start uh, once that the conditions are met from 30 percent to what we we have in the current. Um, such conditions could include a targeted uh, asset quality review uh, to address NPL issues uh, and the level three asset issues. But as I said, the conditions and the, the, the design of this NPL are among the things which will have to be uh, further uh, defined and specified together with the, with the co-legislators. And um, here we you see uh, a summary of which are the proposals, so phase one is reinsurance. The liquidity coverage would start from 30% in 2019 and would go up to 90% in 2021. And uh, indicatively, full liquidity coverage in 2021. Um, between the two phases, there, is, there are the conditions to be fulfilled and uh, to be Assessed by the Commission through report. So this is um, this is uh, this is it for the European Deposit Guarantee Scheme uh, proposal. And uh, now I'll give you some ideas concerning the backstop. Um, as you know, as I said, uh, the SRB is based and running in 2016, but member states agreed already in 2000, um, already in 2013 that uh, there would be a need for a backstop. Um, this backstop is, um, would be a, a mechanism uh, 
uh, that uh, last resource mechanism uh, to be used in case the funds available in single resolution fund are not sufficient to cover um, the resolution of banks. And um, the criteria for this backstop were uh, listed in the EMU reflection paper and are um, basically three. First of all, it has to be um, sufficiently large uh, mechanism to, to be um, used also during crisis. It, it has to be fiscally neutral, meaning that um, although um, the first uh, the, the funds would be first um, taken from the European stability mechanism, they will be afterwards paid back by banks. And the third is that it has to be an instrument which has to work quickly, so um, the, the administrative mechanism uh, to activate and to, to make it function would have to be sufficiently efficient. Um, the banking union communication doesn't enter into the details on that, of course, because it's an ongoing work, this uh, as well. It, uh, it urges, uh, however, the, um, the member states to oper operationalize the European the backstop, um, putting in place as soon as possible a credit line from the European stability mechanism. And um, this backstop will have to be coordinated and articulated in the framework of the upcoming proposal, um, which uh, are aware of um, the framework of uh, the strengthening of the European thing of oh, the uh, the European Monetary Union. Sorry. Um, um, so this is it. I I give the floor to my colleague for for the NPS and that video. Uh, Marcus, this is uh, Pierre speaking. Um, may I just invite you to speak uh, closer to the microphone so that everyone can can hear you? Thanks a lot. I will I will indeed try to speak as closely close to the microphone as I can. Uh, so thanks to Julia for uh, for handing it over to me. Um, NPLs have been rising uh, for a long time in the in the EU in the aftermath of the financial crisis and has in many member states reached uh, quite elevated levels. Um, and PIAS has moreover uh, remained persistent, even though we see a, a decrease in, in uh, the last, let's say, two years. And PIAS are important to tackle because they uh, affect financial stability. It's one of the pockets of risk, remaining risks, that, that Mario was mentioning in the beginning. They weigh on the profitability and impact the viability of banks that uh, are affected by higher levels of NPLs. And importantly, it all, they also impact economic growth by its negative effect on bank lending. Uh, so in the context of the, of the banking union, uh, it's important to remove these remaining residually idiosyncratic pockets of risk. And therefore, uh, NPLs is crucial in, in this context. Moreover, uh, addressing MPLs uh, will, will uh, improve the welfare both of, of citizens and firms, uh, freeing up capital and investment to, to go to the most uh, viable parts of the economy and not being locked up in, in, uh, in unviable uh, businesses. Sometimes you can refer to them as zombie firms, for example. Overall, we are pleased uh, uh, that uh, the European NPL stock is, is now on the decrease. Uh, so the latest figures from the EBA, for example, uh, says that uh, the EU uh, uh, NPL ratio is down to 4.5%, uh, roughly down one percentage point year on year. Uh, this is very good news. However, progress remains slow, especially in the countries and, and, uh, and banks where progress is most needed. Um, when addressing MPLs, it's important to remember that, um, that uh, there are significant differences in the composition of MPLs and the reasons why uh, MPLs are high in various member states and banks. Uh, moreover, uh, many uh, policy instruments remain at national level. 
So, for example, we have judicial uh, judicial systems and, and legal frameworks of uh, insolvency are national. Hence, uh, it's important to remember that banks and member states have a very important role to play in tackling MPLs. However, it's very clear that it's also a European dimension uh, if we're going to solve the problem of MPLs in Europe. Uh, not only have we uh, at least partially complete, and we want to complete the banking union with common supervision. Um, so we have already some institutions relating to banks. Uh, that is already one thing. Moreover, uh, there are potential sign potentially significant spillover effects between countries, where uh, addressing it on a national level will simply not be enough. A high level of MPLs might also impede the common monetary policy in the European Union area and reduce the adjustment capacity of the economy. Finally, uh, there might also be strong uh, confidence effects. Uh, international investors might not be uh, able uh, to, uh, to differentiate between banks in different member states adequately. Hence, European banks overall might need to pay a premium for capital and funding. Therefore, uh, with this in mind, the European Council in its ECOFIN configuration, meaning the finance ministers of the United States, uh, adopted an action plan to tackle MPLs uh, in July this year. This action plan tries to recognize this difficult policy balance between what can best be done at member states and bank level and what can and should be done at European level. And to be clear, the policy action is needed in two areas. First, uh, action is needed to, uh, to address the current stock that is there as a legacy. Any policy action also needs to address um, potential future buildups of MPL and reduce the risk thereof. The action plan uh, that Finance Minister approved um, recognized that there are four different areas where that needs to be addressed in order to effectively tackle MPLs. Uh, firstly, uh, there needs to uh, be very clear that the adequate supervisory policies and powers are there. Secondly, um, the reform of, uh, of insolvency and enforcement practices and judicial systems are key. Thirdly, uh, in order to allow banks not only to manage MPLs on their books, but also, in some cases, when it makes sense, sell them. The development of secondary markets for MPLs are, are essential. Currently, markets are very undeveloped in most parts of the European Union. And finally, uh, we should also aid the restructuring of banking systems to be able to not only to address MPLs, but also for the larger goal of having a, a viable and, and profitable banking system that is um, capable of withstanding future shocks. So in view of this, the Commission uh, in its Banking Union communication uh, announced a package of measure for the spring of next year. Um, these measures aim to, to further and con make concrete uh, what can be done in the context of the Council Action Plan, which is slightly broader. So calls on other institutions and member states to do their bit. So well, the first measure that we announced is that we are going to uh, uh, publish a blueprint for uh, national asset management companies. And for those of you not entirely familiar with asset management companies, it's basically a defeasance structure. It's a runoff vehicle where banks uh, may transfer some of the problematic assets for perhaps more efficient management. Um, it is important in this context to uh, to remember that uh, uh, that such a blueprint for asset management is something asset management company would be uh, would still be up for the member state to decide if it if in their individual circumstances uh, creating such an asset management company makes sense or not. So this blueprint would give them member states clarity on how to set them up. And it would draw on best practices from, from previous instances, uh, for example, Sarab in Spain and Nama in Ireland. Secondly, we are looking uh, into measures to develop the secondary markets for MPLs. 
particularly where uh, we're looking uh, to remove any undue um, hindrances or barriers uh, for the provision of loan servicing uh, by third parties. So for example, if uh, a bank uh, sells a portfolio of PLs to, to an investor, uh, this investor needs to uh, still relate and manage these exposures vis-a-vis -vis the debtors. So we are looking to see if this market can be used. Moreover, in this context, we're also um, seeing if there might be some something that can be done uh, to ease the, the, trans, the, the, asset, the asset transfer in itself. So uh, this is now under, under the analysis. Uh, Thirdly, uh, we are also looking if there are measures that can be taken at European level to uh, better protect secure creditors and potentially allow them to access collateral uh, in a quicker, uh, smoother way uh, uh, outside of the court system. And these type of tools exist in many member states, but not all. And we are currently investigating if there is scope to, uh, to, uh, to do this at the European level, uh, uh, some common principles around this. Fourthly, relating to the, uh, to the supervisory side, we are going to come out with a report, and if necessary and appropriate, uh, accompanied by uh, proposals to amend the CRR, the Capital Requirements Regulation, uh, to potentially introduce minimum levels of bank provisions for future MPLs arising from new alienated loans. So none of the loans that exist on books of banks today will be impacted by this. Um, in this context, uh, uh, you might also be aware that uh, the ECB, in its capacity as banking supervisor, has recently um, uh, issued a, consul a public consul consultation on uh, on a similar measure uh, under their competence under Pillar 2. So uh, the differences between the two measures is that the, the, the measure that the Commission is currently analyzing, if it would be appropriate to introduce, would be um, a statutory backstop, if you, if you will, uh, clearly regulated in the CRR. Uh, and so there would be... The, mandatory deductions in that context, whereas the SSM is looking uh, for s to introduce supervisory expectations uh, regarding provisioning. And that is clearly on a bank-to-bank -bank basis. So these two measures should ideally complement each other. So whatever is not, whatever relevant risks are not covered under the Pillar 1 and the EGO framework that we are investigating could then be covered by, um, by supervisor under Pillar 2. So uh, from our side, we're, we're, we are take note of their consultation. We are interested to see the outcome of the public consultation once it's closes in December. Finally, to underscore the importance of uh, solvency and enforcement, we are also undertaking a benchmarking exercise of loan enforcement, loan enforcement regimes in, in, in the member states. So what does this mean in practice? Um, we are looking to find the quantitative uh, indicators to measure uh, the outcome of an insolvency system. So we're not looking into the, the legal principles of the insolvency system. We're not trying to assess them. We're just trying to assess um, and to show member states what features in insolvency system might be conducive to quick and speedy and high recovery. So with this, I think uh, I'm done, and I will hand over to my colleague David for the last part. Thank you. Hello, hello, everybody. So I will uh, uh, discuss uh, the last element that features in the banking communication, which is the sovereign bond back security. I will first start by saying that this is an idea that has been originated uh, by uh, several academics uh, already several years ago, uh, Bruno Meyer, Garicano, Lane, Pagano, and others. Um, initially, the, pro the, 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 the proposal was called European Safe Bonds and European Junior Bonds, but it is evolved as the proposal has been uh, immersed into the discussion uh, with policymakers. 
my objective in this uh, short presentation are three. I will uh, first uh, give you the context for this for this idea and the objectives of the idea. Then I will explain uh, the idea in a somewhat uh, greater detail. And finally, I will discuss what the European institutions are doing about it, uh, including in this communication. So the first problem that the, that the proposal tries to address is the so-called bank sovereign loop. I almost was about to say the infamous bank sovereign loop. Uh, this, uh, the bank sovereign loop uh, occurs when there are uh, very tight uh, uh, links between the credit worthiness of banks and that of their sovereign. And in this scheme, which comes from the original uh, academic paper, you will see that there are many channels through which banks and sovereigns are intertwined. Uh, in particular, for example, if you imagine a situation where a sovereign is, uh, comes for whatever, whatever exogenous reason under stress, if the banks have a lot of uh, sovereign bonds into their assets, that also brings down uh, the, the net worth, if you wish, of banks, which on one hand impair, impairs their capacity to lend to the economy, which again generates uh, lower growth and reduces the, uh, the tax revenues. That's uh, the first element of feedback. But it is also uh, uh, the case that ultimately the banks may be in such troubles that uh, their own solvency is, ca is called into question and then uh, the expectation is generated in the market that the sovereign may need to step in and support them, which is another uh, uh, pressure on the sovereign uh, fiscal uh, standing. Conversely, uh, again, if banks get in trouble on their own, then the sovereign, if, the, if there is an expectation or an obligation um, of the sovereign to basically support them, including because of the key role that they play into the economies and in the financial, in the payment system, then the sovereign is exposed. And this mechanism, as we all know, was uh, crucially at play in the euro area debt crisis in 2011-12. The other key problem that the SBBS uh, proposal uh, could address, could help address, is the mismatch between the ri raising demand for safe assets and the declining supply. So safe assets meant as government bonds, European uh, euro area government bonds, are, uh, are in a declining supply as a, as a direct consequence of the, uh, the downgrades that many sovereigns have experienced in the wake of the crisis. Um, on the other hand, the demand for safe assets has been increasing, not just because of the general uncertainty that has been brought into the picture by the crisis, but also because some of the regulations that have been introduced post-crisis explicitly require banks, for example, and other uh, market players to hold more safe and liquid assets. Therefore, there is currently uh, an increasing premium on the safe assets, which is basically uh, uh, reflected, for example, in very low yields, in fact, most negative yields of safe assets. And one consideration that has to be kept in mind is that this premium only ends up benefiting those, uh, those governments that do uh, produce safe assets, so basically the AAA uh, member states. So what is the basic uh, idea uh, for the sovereign bond back securities? So the sovereign bond back securities is, in effect, a securitization uh, of euro area uh, government bonds. So uh, an, an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, uh, or any other entity which may be public or private, it doesn't matter at this stage, can uh, basically buy uh, a, a given portfolio of central government bonds uh, on the asset side, uh, on the left side of this scheme, and issue against that uh, different tranches. So there, there, could, there would be a senior tranche and a junior tranche. There could be a mezzanine tranche. And the different tranching uh, basically makes so that the senior, in particular, becomes quite safe. Because uh, the, any first uh, loss of difficulty in the debt service on the assets of this SPV will be absorbed directly uh, first by the junior tranche. So, um, 
by the virtue of diversifying the uh, the asset the, the, the asset side by holding all euro area government bonds and by virtue of the tranching which generates a more senior uh, debt instrument we can uh, create a relatively safe asset the important thing to stress uh, is that this concept is uh, designed with a very uh, clear non mutualization constraint in mind because uh, as you may know there is clearly no appetite for uh, mutualization uh, of risks among euro area member states. So this construct is uh, trying to, con to produce a safe asset, but completely uh, from the private sector side. So the only risk sharing that is uh, occurring with this project is uh, basically among private sector uh, uh, holders of senior versus junior. So what are the main advantages and um, potential advantages of this uh, instrument? Well, as I was saying, uh, it would allow banks to have a much more diversified, potentially a much more diversified uh, pool of sovereign exposures. And that by itself would, link, would weaken the link uh, between a bank and any given sovereign. So it's one part of the loop. Uh, and therefore, there is a reduced impact of the home country's uh, fiscal solvency on, on the banks. But there is also a, a, a new instrument to enable or encourage better cross-border risk sharing in the private sector. Um, and then the second important uh, goal uh, is that uh, there could be basically uh, an expanded supply of safe assets, and importantly, these safe assets will be now produced not just by a few member states, but if in practice every member state would contribute to different extent, of course, to this basically synthetic safe asset. Now, there are, uh, of course, uh, also some questions about this uh, product, and there are some challenges. In particular, uh, we have had, as I will discuss, a lot of interaction uh, with uh, potential market participants on this uh, instrument. And uh, the first question that clearly uh, comes to mind is whether there is sufficient demand for these, for all the tranches. It's quite clear that the senior tranche, uh, given to its uh, safety or added safety, uh, will be quite appealing. But uh, is there demand for the risky uh, part of the product, of the, of the securitization? And uh, since a key tenet of, of this uh, project is that it would be basically, in effect, a private sector uh, product. The question uh, that has to be answered is whether uh, there, there would be sufficient uh, profits in, in the operation so that someone would be interested in combining these bonds, uh, buying all these bonds, and then selling the securitization. Uh, and finally, uh, I would just uh, want to, to uh, point to a question that has been raised by, uh, by many uh, debt management officers in, uh, in our conversation, which is that uh, there is a concern that if there is, a, you know, if this product uh, becomes uh, quite sizable, uh, it, mi uh, it might impact the floating, the amount of floating debt of in some national markets, especially those that have limited debt to begin with so that the liquidity could be adversely affected. So now let me clarify what is the role of the European institutions in this, uh, in this uh, proposal. Uh, because Pierre at the beginning mentioned that the communication says that the Commission will introduce this uh, product. So that's not quite the uh, idea. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, since mid-2016, there is a high-level task force that has been set up comprising uh, representative of 16 national central banks, the ECB, ourselves here at the Commission, the EBA, uh, uh, other academics, uh, and also the debt management of officials. Um, and th this, uh, this task force has been, as, as we speak, is, is investigating the feasibility, the merits, and as well as the challenges of this, uh, this uh, idea. On, on, the, on the basis of the potential benefits, uh, President Juncker, in his uh, uh, LOI, Letter of Intent to uh, accompanying the State of the Union in September, 
committed the Commission to launch uh, by uh, by next year an enabling framework for the development of this instrument. And this has been, in effect, reiterated by the communication, which is uh, which we, uh, in October, which basically says that in light of this work that has been conducted by the ESRB, when it will be completed, the Commission will consider uh, putting forward a proposal that would uh, create an enabling framework for the development of SPBS. So in effect, what the Commission is considering doing is to introduce a regulatory framework that would allow the SPBS to potentially develop. But the Commission is not uh, uh, planning to uh, introduce the product itself, because as I mentioned earlier, a key, uh, key uh, strength of this uh, this uh, initiative from our perspective is that this is in fact a private sector initiative that involves limited if any uh, public uh, intervention and certainly does not uh, involve mutualization among the member states of the and that's my presentation if you agree I would first ask to my three colleagues to make, uh, first of all, thanks to the three of them for the, I think, very thorough and clear presentation. And I would ask to my three colleagues to maybe comment over the poll results that we saw coming at certain points. Sure. Uh, so we'll go again in order. The first, uh, the poll number one. Pierre, can you confirm that all participants have seen the poll results? Um, yes. They will be they will be shared within within a minute. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we go first, and I would ask uh, Julia to comment the first poll. And the first poll was uh, about what is the most important thing to do by an EDIS: liquidity coverage, loss coverage, or both. Thanks a lot, Mario. Um, so as you probably are seeing now, the result says that 31% of you think that the main uh, feature of uh, EDIS uh, to have an effective system would be to have li liquidity coverage. The 11% says that um, it would be the most important loss coverage. And 57% uh, says that um, uh, it would be important to have both, which is uh, for us a good news because it means that we are going in the right direction. Uh, because in the banking union communication, we propose to start um, with the um, full uh, liquidity coverage in the first phase, and uh, but we don't forget, of course, about the lost liquidity, lost coverage, and uh, this is what um, would be um, part of the second stage. Uh, Insurance. Thank you. So, regarding the poll on, on MPLs, um, it seems that 44% uh, of you think that supervisory policies are the most important. And sec secondly, you f uh, second place, you find structural reforms on enforcement and insolvency, that was 32% of you. And then around 22% for the development of secondary market, and just 2% uh, on restructuring of the banking system. And to a certain extent, uh, uh, I have to re recognize that this question is a little bit of a trick question, because actually all of the dimensions are important, and they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, I fully agree with, uh, with most of you that supervisory policies and had, having the adequate supervisory policies are key. And noting that if you have this, uh, the, uh, the development of the secondary market becomes much easier, for example, because then banks will certainly have the right uh, book value in, at all times. Uh, and also, it will, it will help uh, the functioning of the, of the insolvency system. If, if banks uh, uh, recognize the MPLs that they have on their books quickly and, and adequately, and then hence manage them more efficiently. Thank you very much. Pierre, do we have a poll for the third issue? Uh, yes, yes, it's, uh, it's going to appear, uh, but give us just a few seconds. Let me invite, before we, we transition towards the Q&A, uh, let me invite everyone to start thinking of their questions. There will be a few minutes left to uh, publish their questions on the Q&A section, where you will be able, from Brussels, to, to answer questions. Back to you.
Well, uh, here I just see live the results of the poll that uh, I had suggested. It seems that uh, uh, six out of ten of our audience believe that the most important uh, measure indeed to sever this link between sovereign and bank is to complete the banking union via the EDIS, the EDIS scheme. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, you know, saying is quite encouraging because it seems that I think means that we are tackling the right issues. Uh, it's also uh, important, as I see it, one third uh, thinks that it's quite important also to explore uh, further the possibilities to create uh, diversification, further diversification in banks' sovereign exposure with possibly safe assets. And, uh, some, and while the minority view was the, that the, the most effective way to break the link is to ensure Failing by the BRC, that failures of banks are fully, mostly, primarily paid for private sector. Thank you. Voilà. Many thanks, Pierre. We are in your hands. Um, there is a first question that has come from Paolo, who says, Do you believe that the transparency of the banking sector should improve? in future, if yes, how? Um, that's the first of a series of questions. Let me just recall that if we have many questions, we'll regroup them, uh, and we have about 10, 15 minutes to answer them. So I'm encouraging right now every participant to put down their questions so that then we can we can go through them. And um, and Mario, I leave, I leave you the initiative on how you would like to address them. You can uh, address them first, or you, if you would like to distribute to your colleagues. Okay, let me take the first one and then I'll distribute the others to my colleague. I think it's, uh, uh, it's difficult to respond uh, no to improvement in transparency also because this is a bit the sphere rouge of what we have been doing in the last, uh, in the last few years. If you think uh, most of the measures uh, that we have done in all the, in all the banking regulation, uh, in all the banking regulation area have uh, the improvement of transparency as the underlying. So, Good, uh, I think the correct reply to the, the question of Paolo is uh, we have already done a lot, but of course uh, uh, things are, are still possible. There is, for example, lots of debate about the um, environmental, social, and governance factors that should feature more prominently in, uh, in regulation, and the governance factor, of course, include, uh, include transparency. Um. It seems that the communication comes at a moment where new momentum is needed to complete the banking union. Can you elaborate on that? Well, yes. Um, I would say um, the new momentum comes uh, uh, from the fact that uh, we are aware of the progress made. No? This, is, uh, this is undisputable. It's just enough to, if you pick up randomly a, a newspaper in 2012, and you read the economic session, the words that you find most often were redenomination risks, spread, things that now seem completely forgotten. So as we said in the State of the Union, you have to act when it doesn't rain, right? So you mend your roof when the sun shines. And I think this is the fact. We have made lots of improvement. We have put, put the systemic issue behind, which is the precondition in order to be able to act. And now I think it's quite interesting to be able to address the individual, uh, to address the individual issues. So um, I think that is the, that's the new momentum. But it, it's important to understand that it does not come from any particular urgency. It comes from the fact that we know very well, as I said at the beginning, that the work must be complete in order to be sure that you have really improved the, the situation and you have eliminated uh, Part of the uh, of the if you want to generated yes. the systemic risk. Then now I think many many questions are coming, so you should choose. Pierre, let's because, uh, if I do <laughs> let's it, divide uh, the work. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll start off and then uh, and then you can also choose your questions. Uh, let us start with uh, Virag, who came up with a question on um, a scenario if the financial crisis would hit in the EU in 2018. Um, 
and the, the inconsistency was the fact that everything would be operational by 2024. I'll, I'll take that because uh, I, I had that question a number of times. And um, first of all, thanks, Virag. I think it's a good question. Uh, we had that question a number of times, but in particular, we had for the for those who have been around a few months like me, we had it in 2011, 2012. People were telling us, what you do now is to increase capital requirement in banks by 2019, but the crisis is now, what are you doing for now? And our reply then was, uh, markets will anticipate it. And that is exactly what is happening. I mean, markets are uh, the, the beauty and the difficulty, of course, of dealing with financial markets regulation is that markets anticipate, and, and they anticipate uh, pretty well. Capital requirement, my best example, is the liquidity ratio. The liquidity ratio, if you ask to the audience, you do a poll and you say, uh, what do you think liquidity ratio is? Uh, the vast majority of people will give you a number. Now, there is no liquidity ratio rule, law, now in Europe. And yet, everybody respects it. Why? Because they know that it will come. So I think it's the anticipation that plays an important role in financial markets. Uh, where we have a question from uh, Julian asking to elaborate on the absence of a reference to IPS in the Banking Union communication, a lot of acronyms there. Uh, what is your idea of a balanced solution? Um, and Julian quotes the communication. So I guess it's for Julia. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, the IPSs are not mentioned in the, in the communication because they are not also in the original proposal uh, on EDIS. Uh, we didn't uh, um, include them in the EDIS proposal because they are a uh, specificity of Germany and um, and a few other member states. That's why they were that's why they were not included in the original proposal. Julia, can I ask you what an IPS is? Yeah. Sorry. Um, the 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 balance. Um, see. Um, okay. is, is, uh, is an investor protection scheme which is a, spe a specific, um, um, let's say, um, setting of that, that exists in Germany uh, where banks um, don't have uh, a, de a deposit guarantee scheme as, as it is in other member states, but they pay a contribution to a private uh, entity which then manage... Okay. Uh, the repayment in case of uh, bank default. Um, so to conclude on this, on this question, uh, the balance has to be found, of course, uh, with the co-legislator, meaning the council and the parliament, because um, that's how it goes, the legislative uh, process. It's not uh, up to the commission to decide how, in the final um, design, the IPSs will be treated. Um, uh, th there was also another question yeah. that maybe I can answer, uh, which is the bank's obligation on EDIS. Um, so banks basically pay uh, a contribution uh, based on the risk that they carry to the national DGSs right now, and uh, this, a similar system will be uh, applied uh, in case of a European deposit guarantee scheme. So meaning that the banks will pay the, their contribution to the to the fund to the European fund, and this will be the money which will be used in case of uh, a bank default. Great. Sorry, there is just another question on EDIS which came up uh, now. Maybe I can answer that as well. Uh, Bernardo is asking. Bernardo is asking uh, if we uh, our intention is to uh, de to get rid of the third phase, which is full insurance. I think um, the. Uh, it, it disappeared uh, in the in the wording, let's like say, but actually the final goal is the same, which is to have full liquidity and loss coverage. Uh, so, and as I said, the Commission proposal stays on the table. So, the the, the goal Thank of you. having full insurance. Uh, moving end. to NPLs, there were a few questions, uh, Marcus. I think the first one was on what was the main idea, asks Daniela, on uh, beyond decreasing the provisions for new NPLs. Uh, well, I will go ahead and assume that this is uh, part of a typo. I think that the, the idea is to, uh, if there have been under provisioning, there would be an increase of, of provisioning or at least setting some minimum levels of provisioning. So the idea is that if uh, 
if there is a case where a bank uh, has not adequately provisioned the prudential uh, risks or the, the losses uh, on their books uh, under the standard accounting framework, uh, then uh, there would be some minimum level that uh, after a certain time would kick in. Okay. The fact that disposing of NPLs would improve liquidity by reducing asymmetric information. And so he asks, how could a secondary market for NPLs be created? Um, for example, could those loans be securitized and who would invest in them? I mean, a, a few big questions there. Yes. No, I think uh, in order to uh, create secondary markets for NPLs, there needs to be uh, several preconditions need to be fulfilled. I think uh, one of them is the one that that, uh, that I mentioned during my presentation in making sure that there are no barriers of uh, as small barriers of entry as possible, both for investors but also for the the, the firms that do the, the kind of grant work, meaning the loan servicers. Uh, um, th that is very important. Secondly, uh, the supervisory side is also important. Uh, banks uh, might face disincentives to sell if they have under provision, so having the adequate provisioning level is also important. Moreover, uh, perhaps a, a key aspect is to, to have uh, the banks uh, for themselves, for their own management, but also when they sell, they have very good quality of information regarding their loan portfolios. So uh, together with the EBA uh, um, and the ECB, the Commission is working to, uh, to improve the situation on, on data availability and also how this data can be, uh, can be used in order to, to, to facilitate a secondary market. So I think there is a okay, multi-dimensional multi um, Can we move to the questions on, uh, on safe assets? Uh, we had one by Lothar, for example, who was asking, does um, the ESRB's uh, HLTF on safe assets have a time schedule to address um, any recommendations? That could be one. Um, well, the, the task force is uh, working as we speak. Uh, and uh, the plan uh, at this point is to uh, report back to the general board the ESRB that established the yeah. task force in December. So, so that's the timeline for the task force. Task force is hoping to conclude its work fairly soon. Uh, what is uh, going to happen, happen after that, I am not uh, sure. It's uh, in flux. Uh, but, uh, but the target is to, uh, to report back what we have learned Okay. Was there another point you wanted to ask uh, or to add, uh, David, to this, to, to the, the question of safe assets? I, I was glad that you clarified uh, the fact that it was uh, an idea and a proposal that was in the air uh, already before. Of, of course, the, the communication as I as wrongly. Yes, it's a. Uh, it's uh, for the role that the Commission has at this point is just an ancillary to do with the ensuring that the regulatory treatment of the instrument is pediment. I just uh, noticed that uh, the poll that I suggested has changed a uh, bit. So I commented on a dynamic uh, poll. And, but I see uh, that basically there has been no substantive change. Still, 44% uh, of the audience really believe that the most important uh, okay. to break the lead yep. in the bank. Sorry, if I may, because there is a question uh, on Edith. Um, Naida is asking, and it's important to clarify that. Um, she's asking whether we will forward the legislative proposal on that or not. When I say the, the 2015 proposal is still on the table, we mean that uh, there would be no other pro legislative proposal. So the modifications, the ideas that we put forward are uh, to be negotiated during the negotiation of the current legislative proposal, which is okay. on, on the Thank table. Thank you. If there was any uh, last question you wanted to address, Mario, feel free to yep. do so. 
Of what I see, Daniela asking, could you send us the presentation from today? Shall yes. I? Shall we end with a with a tough question and and ask whether will we whether we have a complete banking union by uh, the end of this uh, commission, according to you? Uh, but I will not risk my reputation with a yes or a no. What I will certainly say is that we are working for that, and what I see is that we have uh, the conditions for that to be possible. So I really hope that uh, Parliament and Council will uh, will work uh, uh, on the basis of the Commission proposals in, in good and tant, if possible, uh, even adding something. But I think uh, that's the objective we should have, and that is the very okay. clear objective. We are uh, precisely on time to conclude. Uh, let me thank again Mario and, and his team uh, for the very interesting presentations, for the fascinating Q&A. And thank also, of course, all the participants who joined in from uh, all over the, wor the world. Um, it's been great fun, and we're going to make sure that we have, as someone suggested in the chat box, several of those uh, multi-speaker online seminars. So uh, good luck with the, the rest of the day, uh, and the weekend is near, as is the football game of tonight. So thanks again, and, um, and see you very soon on the platform.